So today I'm in Herefordshire with Mark Blandford, the founder of Sporting Bet and a venture capitalist and gentleman of the turf, I suppose, these days. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. That's all right, Simon. <laughs> um, Thanks for your interest. <laughs> Can you tell us from the start, I've read that you worked in food marketing and local radio before getting into bookmaking. That's a rather unorthodox route into the game, in inverted commas. Can you tell us about your early days and youth in business? Um, well, I suppose I would have said I was always entrepreneurial in nature. Um, I went to what's now called Wolverhampton University and I studied business studies specialising in marketing. So the first two jobs, while they appear a bit diverse, was part of a plan to get some FMCG, fast moving consumer goods marketing with food. And also I wanted, I did some industrial uh, marketing as well. And then that led me into working for the local radio station. And all of a sudden I found myself at about 27 years of age thinking, um, well, to be honest, the wife was saying we ought to think about starting a family. And I was thinking we ought to be starting about running my own business rather than waiting for dead men's shoes in these companies. Anyway, obviously I won that particular argument um, and in 1984 we bought a backstreet betting shop. So that's how we led from those industries uh, into the bookmaking game. So did you always have an interest in betting and gambling or was that just a business opportunity? No, I always had something of an interest. The reality is my father was, um, and, and in fact both families, uh, uh, my mother and my father's side, had been in and around horse racing. On my mother's side, my grandfather was a horse dealer. She and her brother both rode in point to points. And on my father's side, he was a champion amateur jockey. Uh, my grandfather, sorry, was a champion amateur jockey. And in fact, he rode at the first Cheltenham Festival. My father's best friend in the world was Michael Scudamore Sr. In fact, both my parents and Miriam uh, Michael Scudamore were very uh, close and involved in horse racing. Uh, my father is a, is a um, owner of a leg in a few horses over the years. And I learned at school, um, I went to one of these horrible schools, Hereford Cathedral School, where we were supposed to go to school on Saturday morning. I think I had the worst attendance record in the whole school for Saturday mornings, although it was pretty good for the rest of the week. And it was because Dad used to go racing on a Saturday and he'd take me. And although originally I sort of figured out it was um, probably a nicer thing to do to go racing than to study Latin or whatever else they were trying to teach me on a Saturday, um, I actually got genuinely interested when I was on the course, and this would have been early mid-teens. Right, so you, you said you acquired your first betting shop in 84, in a location you described as back street. How hard in every sense of the word were those early days? Yeah, Queen's Road, Malvern Link to be precise. Um, how hard was it? Well, it was hard, but I had a bit of a lucky break as well. Uh, I won't name him, but the gentleman who sold me the shop had been fiddling the betting tax. Uh, he hadn't been doing a huge amount of volume of business, but he'd been understating what he was doing to HMRC. So when I finally got my foot through the door, I actually found that the business, particularly on the telephone side, was bigger than he'd been representing. So that was an unexpected bonus. Um, it was all a bit tired and a bit run down, so a lick of paint and uh, putting myself out and about around the local community started to help. And, and gradually we built the business. The challenges were the usual ones really. Uh, sharp punters or punters with the odd bit of information who would distort my, my book, not just for the race or for the day, but sometimes for the week if I let them on for what they wanted. Uh, and of course, um, being a betting shop in a back street, it was near a local's pub and uh, one or two would come in after uh, probably having been in the pub for a bit too long. So they also took a bit of managing. Uh, I'm assuming that there was probably some quite desperate times in those early days when the favourites kept winning and those sharp punters kept coming in. What kept you going in the business? I think an innate belief uh, that uh, if I manage the business sensibly, um, look, betting shops in those days up and down the country were not going out of business. So I think it was a case of being sensible. I, I very quickly learned to knock punters back who I think... Uh, probably were ahead of the marketplace in those days. Uh, it was a very different marketplace. Um, but otherwise, just an innate belief. And, and I always say to people, it, it's not a crime to make a mistake, but it's a crime to make the same mistake twice. So trying to build on that philosophy and learn as I went. Okay, thank you. Um, now, we talked previously uh, um, before this interview and you did confide that you 
made more money pro punting than you did from betting shops. So we had four betting shops and that takes some doing. What was your angle there? I suppose a glib answer could be perhaps that the shops weren't the best, <laughs> but, but no, we did have some, a couple of good shops. Um, look, the market was very different then. This was all in a very, pre, you know, we're talking here about the, the mid, well, probably the late uh, 80s into early 90s. And the reality was that the betting market was starting to open up. We hadn't got the internet, but the spread betting boys had come along. And they were making markets in, in, in new markets. And in my humble opinion, and, and, and subsequently confirmed actually by a few people who were in the trade, they were guessing at what the spread should be and where it should be. And I'd hired a, a, a bright young lad who'd come along in, initially to work as a cashier, but he ended up managing a shop for me. But during a period of time, I used to get him to do some data analysis. So whilst some of the markets were based on guesswork, or innate belief that punters want to go long, not short, in the case of spread betting. We actually did some data analysis and, and found out some of the facts. Um, just some other general research as well. So I suppose it was the beginnings of a, a, a pricing engine in the sense that we knew where the true probability lay. And then it, there was no guessing involved after that. We'd just play whichever side gave us a statistical advantage. Well, so you got technical before the technical side came in then, really? I suppose it was an analytical frame of mind, yes. So by 1997, you built up a betting shop, Empire. How many shops did you have by then? Oh, five. It wasn't a, not a great empire, but uh, we hadn't got any great money. It was um, organic growth, really. But, but at that time, you decided it was the right time to get out of betting shops. In hindsight, was that the right time? Yeah, it wasn't a conscious decision of I want to be out of betting shops. It was a conscious decision that I want to be in internet gambling and not having got a, enough money to have the seed capital to develop an online uh, bookmaking business. I had no choice but to sell the shops to get into the online game. Okay, so you invested your pot into uh, originally, I believe, net bets, which soon morphed into sporting bet. Correct. Um, and at the time, the internet was still viewed with suspicion at least as far as putting in bank details, etc. Uh, what convinced you that the public were about to embrace it and trust it? Yeah, uh, what convinced me? Well, first of all, I th there were probably two primary reasons. Number one, I knew that in other parts of the world we hadn't got a betting tax on stakes, which of course we used to have in the UK in those days in the shops. So instantly I had like a 9% competitive advantage when we set up down in Alderney in the Channel Islands. So from the UK perspective, I think that was fairly compelling. Uh, it was also a distribution channel that would work on a global basis. And I knew that many markets around the world were either supplied by illegal suppliers or by state monopolies who ripped people off. So again, a different kind of competitive advantage. But I just felt that there were huge opportunities either way and I was just keen to get stuck into that. Um, so the, the likes of Denise Coates and Teddy Saggy became billionaires, but you were the first to really make a success. Um, so what made you so sure that you went all in to become an online bookmaker? I think it's back to those uh, competitive advantages, Simon. Really, they were both fairly compelling. So I knew and understood in detail the size of the UK market and the impact of that 9% betting tax. So to me, that was a no-brainer. I think where I had to be more thoughtful was in terms of international expansion, choosing markets, getting it right. It's something that's very easy to say, but you've got to localise the product. You've got to have the content as in, you know, if we're talking a, for it, just to make up an example, Hong Kong, you've got to have the Hong Kong race cards in a digital format to be able to offer it. And, and you've got to be able to do customer service and payments uh, all localised because not everywhere in the world uses international credit cards, for example. So there's a lot of actual detailed work that needs to be done behind uh, the scenes to take advantage of that big competitive advantage.